Good evening. Start with a question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? It's a question I've been asked. It's a question I've asked to other people. It's a question that maybe you've even asked yourself. Do I really know him? And as you can see, the title on the the YouTube channel is That You May Know. And we're going to be continuing tonight through our study in the book of Ephesians. And my hope and my prayer is that as we learn from God's word, we'll be able to understand that question and, and at least know how can I truly be able to answer that with a confident and solid Yes, I know him. Yes, I know Jesus. So please turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to continue our study through this epistle, this letter written to the Ephesian church. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 15 tonight. Give you a moment to turn there. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Let's pray and we'll get into the study. Father, I thank you. I thank you this evening that you've allowed us a time to gather, to hear your word, to study the scriptures, to take advantage of different uh, platforms and technology to see your word continue to go forth. I thank you that, God, we have this ability, we have uh, the freedom. Still, we're holding on to it, God, to teach your word, to share your word, to study your word, to own a a, a copy of your word, God, to possess these scriptures. I thank you, God, that we have yet that freedom. And Lord, I pray tonight as we study, as we read, I pray, God, you would teach us. Lord, help us understand that, that question and help us come to a place of of knowing how to answer with a yes, that I do know him. God, I pray tonight you would help us understand your word. I pray tonight that you would speak a powerful, life-changing word to us as we study. God, I pray for those in this time of difficulty, still suffering sickness, we continue in prayer for healing. God, we continue in prayer for those that are working on the front lines, continuing to deal with this sickness, with this virus. God, please come to their aid, come to their help. God, encourage them, give them hope. God, I pray you protect them, bring healing. And Father, as you know, there's this tension between you know job loss and and unemployment and going back to work and. Uh, God, just being able to provide, there's, there's so many challenges, God, so many people still suffering financially. God, I pray for your help and your provision. Father, would you comfort those who are mourning today and grieving today? And those of us that have been comforted, God, would you encourage us and give us boldness to reach out and comfort others? God, I pray for a greater, fuller understanding of the truth of your word and how to apply it to our lives. God, speak to us tonight, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Ephesians chapter 1, I encourage also, before we get into this verse 15 through the end, uh, just look into scripture. If you haven't had a chance to from last week until this week, excuse me, uh, read in the book of Acts, chapter 18, 19, and 20, and you'll see these, these trips that, that Paul took, the, the writer of this letter, these uh, times that he visited Ephesus and what took place there, what went on was so exciting. It's, a, it's an awesome, awesome testimony 
of you know, people who were lost in idolatry and worship of false gods and, and magic and witchcraft and all kinds of, of twisted things that don't pertain to the true and living God. And when the gospel came in, in power and in truth, lives were changed. They were impacted so significantly. And I, I just love in the book of Acts reading about how, you know, the, the, the businesses suffered, the people who would sell these idols. The, the, the locals didn't want to buy the idols anymore because they forsook that type of worship and followed the true and living God. And the magicians, it says, they burned all their books. So much money, so much uh, great value worth of books, they burned them. People radically forsaking a lifestyle uh, of just idol worship and turning to Jesus with just passion that, that spread across that land. It's an exciting, exciting time in the history of the church. And then we read also in the book of Revelation, seeing for the future, what, what was it that God had to say to that church? Where did, what did they turn into, the Ephesian church? But tonight, as we continue to dive into this letter that was written a few years after Paul's last visit to Ephesus, it's, it's exciting what he's about to share right now. We have the beginning portion of this letter being about God's, God's riches, God's grace. And we developed a little bit last week looking at verses 1 through 14, this doctrine, this, this teaching, biblical teaching of God's grace and God the Father choosing and the redemption that's in Jesus and the inheritance and the seal of the Holy Spirit and this whole work of salvation to those who believe. And now Paul's going to address the church directly in, in a really great way. Let's get into it. It's... I'm excited. So verse 15, let's read. It says, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Take this real quick. This, this transition in the in the chapter, a new thought here. Paul's writing to this church. He explains to them about salvation and the inheritance and the redemption in Jesus. And he's writing to these, these believers who, you know, later in chapter 2, speaking of the, the Gentiles who came to Christ, not, not, not Jews who came, but people who were just lost in, in idol worship and, and pagan worship and all kinds of false religions coming to the faith. What does he say? I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints. I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I think it's so exciting to read this letter knowing what Paul's experience was in Ephesus and how he left that place and he brought other disciples with him, brought other ministers with him to stay there. Hey, you guys... Continue on in this place. And then we read in, in the letter to Timothy, he told him to stay. He says, I urged you. Just like I told you when I was with you, I'm urging you again. Stay in Ephesus and make sure that people don't start teaching improper doctrine, teaching uh, things that are not true, teaching things that are different from sound scriptural biblical doctrine. Keep, keep them on track. Keep them in the word. Keep them uh, moving forward according to the truth. Don't let uh, false ideas and philosophies and other doctrines and, and, and false teaching come in. We got to straighten it out. Stick to the scripture. Stick to the word. Teach them the truth. The same gospel that had an impact when they first believed, keep it up. Jesus Christ, him crucified, resurrected from the dead. The, the, the same salvation that we read about here in verses 1 through 14, there was a need for an establishment of solid, sound doctrine. And I, I, I like here, at least we see a few years down the line, Paul's encouraging them, affirming them. 
I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. They, got a, they have a, a reputation that's, that's being known throughout the land, a reputation. The word got back. The word got back and said, yeah, the Ephesian believers, they have faith in the Lord Jesus and they love all the saints. There's this self-sacrificial giving toward all the believers. There, there's really a love uh, among them. And I love, what did Jesus say? This is how the world will know that you're my disciples, by the way that you love one another, by the way that you give of yourself for one another, by the way that you think of the other person before yourself, serve one another. That's what Jesus' mark, as he explained it, is of a, a true disciple, a true follower. As Jesus knelt down, wrapped the towel around his waist after that, that last supper night, uh, that evening, and he washed his disciples' feet uh, as they were going to eat dinner that night. He said, what I'm doing to you, you also ought to do for one another. Humility. Philippians chapter 2. I know we're getting into Philippians on Sunday. Looking into that. You'll see as you read God's word, a humility, how Jesus represented true, pure humility. Let us have the mind of Christ. And so he's telling them, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. What a beautiful reputation and testimony. And I think about churches today, churches at large, different congregations Different churches that have been established or planted or groups of believers that have been set up. And I, I think, give them a little bit of time. And a few years down the road, after having been taught, after having been prayed for, after having been, been seeing miracles and witnessing amazing things and awesome experiences and having solid teaching and having many missionaries come, some for long periods of time, some for short, some teaching sound doctrine, and, and false things coming as well, but people getting rid of that, uh, people standing firm. No, we need to stick to the truth. And then you come back, four or five years down the road and check on that ministry, that church, that Bible study, that group, how are they doing? People that, let's take it on an individual level, people that maybe you had a chance to minister to, to preach the gospel to, to introduce to Jesus, and man, they, they get excited, they come to the Lord, they, 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 they repent, they believe amazing experiences and then you don't hear from him for a while and you come back and you hear word about so and so what is that word that you're going to hear and and i guess we don't have much control over what we hear about other people what we hear about other churches but what would be the word that people hear about us what is the four or five year pause of, man, I'm not sure how that church is doing, haven't heard anything from them, but here's the latest news. We finally find out four or five years down the road, man, CCIOG, here's what's going on. These guys are full of faith. It's increasing. They're spreading the gospel. They really believe what they read. They really stand firmly upon the truth of God's word, and man, do they love each other. I've never seen a group of people who sacrifice so much for one another, who care so much about one another, who are willing to give whatever they have to serve the other. I hope so. I hope that's a reputation that we're building. I hope that's a reputation we're working towards. Not so that we would have uh, just a great name and we can be impressive, but that we don't fall into uh, really the contrary. Striving to be a, a people standing upon faith and, and loving one another because that's what God's given us and called us to as a church. Where the contrary, what, what, what could it be? Look at this in the, in the alternative. 
I heard that they don't really have faith in the Lord. And they kind of, they kind of don't like each other. I heard that they're, they're struggling to believe. And there's hatred and, and, and backbiting and, and murmuring and complaining about each other and, and dishonesty going on in the midst. And there's people in there who are just trying to tear everything apart and, and coming against every little detail and every little thing that they possibly can. There's division, biting and devouring one another. I, 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 I can't tell by looking at their life that they believe. Now, now I hope that's not going to be our reputation. I hope that's not your reputation. I hope that's not what happens after somebody checks up on you four or five years down the road, 10, 15 years down the road, 20, 30 years down the road. See, I'm not here right now to make a claim and say, well, of course we're not faithless and unloving I'm here to say, look, this is what we need to go for. I think there might be little bits of faithlessness or lacking of faith or weak faith. I think there might be little bits of selfish pride and selfish ambition and, and putting self first instead of others where there isn't this solid mark of pure love. And I, I'm, I'm not... What, what, who am I kidding? Yeah, I'm trying to come down on that stuff. There's no condemnation in Christ. Uh, get, don't get me wrong. Listen, if, if what's stirring in you right now is, is a little bit of brokenness, a little bit of conviction, that's because the Holy Spirit's here with us, and he's the one doing that work, trying to purify, sanctify, make us like Jesus, give us the mind of Christ, correct, rebuke, instruct, that's what God's word does. The doctrine of God's word is, this, is established. And when we have our own ideas of what we think God's word says, we have to compare our ideas and our understanding with God's word. And we are, uh, the what's the word? Reproof, all right? So the first step is reproof. Make the comparison. God's word, my thoughts. God's word is true. If my thoughts don't line up, they got to go in the trash. And then I need to correct. For God's word is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. Everything I just threw in the trash that's not true, according to my own understanding, I need to have it firmly established by God's word. Be corrected. And then once I have a correct understanding of God's word and scripture, what? Then I can walk it out by following the instruction. And so may God help us as we try to move forward here. May God help us be a people of great faith, a people of great love, one for another. And I like what he says about that church. He says, I, don't to, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I love it. I, just the heart of Paul, that we could see it through his words here. Now, he's not a perfect man. He's a man. But look at what he's saying. He said, I don't cease to give thanks for you. And I make mention of you in my prayers. These people, he heard this good reputation. He's given thanks to God for them, encouraging them on and praying for them. And he's going to explain in these next few verses. He's going to write out what he's praying for them, how he's praying for them. And it's, it's so encouraging to know somebody's praying for you. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. Type amen. Prayer is powerful. And it's encouraging to know somebody's praying for you. Now, now if I'm stubborn... 
and I'm not living according to God's word, the prayer might look a little different for me than this one does for this church. I think if I'm being stubborn and not following God's word, I need to be convicted. I need to be rebuked. I need to be corrected. I don't need to be encouraged in the way that I'm living. I need to be broken down and corrected according to the truth of God's word. But here he's following up on this, uh, your faith, your love for all the saints. He says, I'm giving thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. The church wasn't perfect. I, I don't see here that he's saying that church was perfect, and he's like, man, you guys got this. No, that's why he's praying for them, because they still have need. They still have lack, and so he's praying for them. And I, I want to encourage you to take some time when you study God's word next, when you decide I'm going to sit down for the next five minutes, 15 minutes, half hour, three hours, whatever, the next time you're really going to study God's word and, and tie it in to, to learn a little bit more about what we're studying here tonight and to help you grow, I'd encourage you look through the Bible for the prayers Look for the prayers that we find in Scripture. I want to I grow in prayer. I'm, I'm, I'm all with you, 100%. I'm in the same place. I want to know how to pray more. I want to know how to pray according to God's will. I want to grow in prayer. So I'd encourage you, digging through Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. Find where people were praying. Find where people were seeking God on behalf of themselves, their family, the people around them, their nation, churches. Look at the epistles. You could read through a lot of the epistles. There's a lot of prayers you'll find in these letters to the churches. This prayers of, of repentance and offering up to God just a broken heart and praying for his forgiveness. Prayers, I mean, the Psalms, offering up these worship to God. I, I would just encourage that. Do some digging. Look in the epistles. Look throughout the Old Testament, New Testament. Jesus' instruction to his disciples. That's a great place to start. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Or it's been called that. I don't know what you call it. But we look in scripture and how Jesus instructs his disciples with this form of how to pray. He says, let your prayers be like this. So anyway, this is, let's take some time. Look into God's word. Let his scripture model for you a life of prayer and how to pray and how to seek God. And not that we're just going to repeat scriptures. This is what I pray. I will pray that the Lord says that prayer is, is not about uh, rehearsing and uh, impressing God and having all the big words and having the right words. Prayer is not about this in the brain, intellect. Prayer is about the heart. Prayer is about openness. Prayer is about brokenness before God. Prayer is about real connection. Imagine if in your most close relationship with another human being, your communication with them was all about, um, here's what I prepared and here's what I wrote down to share with you. I'm not really going to look at you in the eye. I I've only written this out because I want to make sure I say all the right things and do it the right way. And, and their, their response to you was the same way. Well, I have written that this and there's no, there, there, it's hard to find life in that. If, if, if life and communication was only letters and words written on pages, rehearsed, I don't know, things would just be kind of weird. I mean, we're kind of coming to that now. We're all writing emails, writing text messages. I mean, we've got FaceTime, so we can do videos. But I just, what am I saying is prayer has to be something alive. Prayer's got to be something of connection, real heart connection with God. Verse 17, let's, let's, let's see what this prayer is about here. Let's see what is Paul praying for this church. He says, this is my prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, 
may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. All right, let's break that down. Let's, let's, let's see what this prayer is, is about. How is he praying for this church? First God, that God, again, the same God who started the work in you, the same God who called you, who redeemed you, who's given you an inheritance and who's sealed you, the same God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation. This is... uh, Personally, something I, I pray often when going into this, the study of God's word or the teaching of God's word, I pray because I, I see this and I've, I've understood what it means and the significance of it and the importance of it. And I pray this, and let's break it down. So wisdom and revelation These two words, just to get a little bit of an understanding, I don't want us to get lost in definitions and lost in, you know, letters on a page, but wisdom typically is gained by learning, and it's the ability to know how to use information. Wisdom is being being able, knowing how to use information. And then revelation is to discover what was once unknown. So wisdom gained by learning or experience, how to use information that you've gathered, that that same experience that you've learned, how do you live now according to that? So, and we have um, revelation, is to discover something that was unknown. And what is it? Why do we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation? It is in the knowledge of him. What does that mean, in the knowledge of him? That word knowledge there, I'll just say we have a difficulty in the English language where uh, we use the word know in so many different ways. The word know or knowledge, we use it in a lot of different ways. Uh, and, And in even, you know, you go from, English to Spanish, you, at least you have two different words that talk about uh, knowledge. I can know something, some factual information, but then there's a different word that, that means I can know by experience, or I can know by being thoroughly acquainted with, or recognize, or be familiar with someone, having a a, a real experience, a real connection. See, there's information, and then there's there's that knowledge of of real knowing through acquaintance, through thoroughly acquainted. And and what, what are we saying here? Obviously, this knowledge we're talking about is not in the information category, academic study, words, definitions, information, that's what it means to know God. That's not what scripture teaches us. That's not what he's praying for them. He's not praying that they would become scholarly and have this mental uh, ascension above everybody else and have an amazing information bank of stuff about God. See, that's how we would say it in English here. I can know about someone or I can know someone personally. And his prayer is that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, not growth in information about him. See, being a follower of Christ 
I can have I could have a lot of information. I could have a lot of words memorized. I can have a lot of uh, you know, facts that I could just pull out of my brain. And they could be good facts, godly facts, Bible verses memorized, scripture that I know it, I could recite it I, off the top of my head. But where does the problem lie if there's a problem if that is the fullest extent of the Christian experience is words on a page, in a book, on a shelf. God's word, the scriptures, are absolute, authoritative, 100% accurate, without a shadow of doubt, will never be proven wrong. And so what it says in them is true, authoritative, will never be proven wrong, are only being proven correct as we go through history and discover more evidence. So in no way am I saying that we don't need that. We need the Bible. We need scripture. We need the truth of God's word. That's why we teach. That's why we open it up. See, paper and ink doesn't change lives, but the truth and the principles of what God's word saying when applied, watch out, that's what changes lives. And so I can know information about God or I can know God. See, if you ask me, do I know such and such a person? If I've never met them, talked with them, seen their face, spent time with them, heard them laugh, heard them cry, all kinds of experiences, if I've never had any of that, but I've read biographies and I've read information about them, I cannot tell you that I know that person. I haven't seen them deal with hard times, good times, prosperous times, poor times. I haven't seen how they react to trial, how they react to joy, how they react to different things. I can't say that I know that person. I can't stand before you today and say, I know Abraham Lincoln because I read all the books about him. I could, trust me, I haven't read all the books about him either. But if I did, I could put a real convincing argument that I know a lot about this individual because I read books about that individual. But I will never be able to say, I know this person. I am thoroughly acquainted with them, and I recognize them. I I, I know what their voice sounds like. I know what it's like when they, you know, I, I recognize who this person is. I could tell from a mile away. There's no familiarity there. There's information but not a familiarity. And what are we talking about? Why am I spending so much time on this? The importance is that the prayer that Paul has for this church is that God would give them the wisdom, that he would give them that that learning, that they would understand and have revelation, something they didn't know beforehand. They didn't know God. They didn't have a connection with him, fellowship with him. They knew about idols. They knew about false religion. They knew about demonic things, but they did not know know the true and living God. And so his prayer is that they would know him. And he continues, by knowing God intimately in fellowship as the Father, as the Lord, as the Savior, by knowing him, what happens? The eyes of your understanding are enlightened, verse 18, that you may know. He's going to list three things right here that he is praying, that they really come to understand about God. Primarily, they know God, and they know who he is, but now they're going to, they need to know how he works. It says that the, the knowledge of him is that, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know. What is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? So we got three things. Hope of his calling, riches of his inheritance, and greatness of his power. 
Why do we need to know those things? Because, here, before I answer, I'll give you a minute to think about that. Why is it important? Ask that question to yourself. Pause the video for a second and sit and think before you go and listen to me. Huh? Pause and think. This is the benefit of watching the video here. Pause. Seek God. Why? You know, maybe ask yourself a couple questions first. One, ask the question we asked in the beginning. Do you know Jesus? Do I know him? Do I know him according to that understanding of the word, of a, of a familiarity or a, a thorough acquaintance? Do, I have, do you have a thorough acquaintance with God? Or do you have a brain filled with information about God? Wrestle with that for a minute. Chew on that for a minute. I know God is good. I've said that. You've said that. We've heard it said. God is good. Where does that come from? Does that come from here? Does that come from, I heard it in a movie and I liked it? Does that come from, well, that's what they say in some other country? Or does that come from, no, I know God is good and he has been good to me because, let me tell you, let me, let me tell you my story. Let me share you my testimony. Let me show you how I know that God is good. See, I think it's important we start to remember some of these things. So that question, do I know him. Now you ask yourself, why is it important for me to know the hope of his calling? Why is it important for me to know the, the riches of his inheritance? Why is it important for me to know the greatness of his power? Why do I need to be able to see and perceive and understand these truths of who God is rather than just holding in my brain information about it, but never being able to experience it and access it. All right, come back. See, the hope of his calling, I need to be firmly established and built up in hope of his calling because I need to realize he did not call us for no reason. There is Hope for the reason and purpose of God's calling. That's what we were reading through, that it was his good pleasure. to. And we're going to develop this as we continue to study through Ephesians. This isn't the only chapter in the book, so everything's going to connect together. There's a hope of his calling. There's a reason and a purpose why God has called you. Are you aware of it? Are you hopeful in it? Are you looking forward to fulfilling God's calling in your life? Are you looking for ways that you can follow the will of your Father? God, what is it that you'll have me to do today? What is it that you're wanting to do in and through my life today, God? How can I be hopeful in your calling, knowing that you called me for a reason and I put myself at your service? God, work in and through me. Lead me, God. Send me. I'll go. Give me hope. Not to be hopeless. Not to think, well... I don't know. I'm no good for nothing. God couldn't use me. God couldn't do anything through my life. Did God call you? He will. He has a plan. He has a purpose before the foundations of the earth. He's prepared good works for you to walk in them. See, that, that, I'm jumping chapters, but we'll do, we're, this thought is going to continue to be developed as we study through the book. But God has a purpose for calling you. And he's got a plan for you to walk out for his glory, for his kingdom. People that need to hear the gospel from your lips. People that need to receive a powerful witness from your life. According to his truth, by the power of his spirit. 
See, see, God's calling and God's purpose is the gospel going forth. It's not our own personal benefit and our comfort and our, you know, life is great and look what I have. No, it's Jesus, the gospel. I'm naked, I'm destitute, I'm without food, I'll go to the ends of the earth. Wherever God will have me go, that's what I will do. That's his calling, to preach the gospel to every creature, to make disciples of every nation. And if there isn't enough support and money to make you a missionary, you work hard with your hands, like Paul did. Making tents, selling them, so that way he can keep doing ministry. Everything about my life has to be centered on serving Jesus and spreading the gospel. My, I cannot be at the center of my life. That's not the reason why God called me. God did not call me to have a happy home, a white picket fence, and a nice little family, and live peacefully here on earth. That time will come, but right now the gospel has to go forth. The message needs to be preached. That's God's calling. He has, see, that's what we're talking about next. The inheritance, that will come. There's a richness in his inheritance. It's not about riches right now and prosperity right now. It's about make a sacrifice, reach the lost, help somebody, please. That's the calling. And we have hope in that. And we walk according to that. There's richness of God's inheritance. We're always looking forward to it. We're looking forward to the riches. We're looking forward to what's to come in God's kingdom when he unites all things, when he brings this whole story to an end. We're looking forward to it. But my life right now is not supposed to be me-centered, my family-centered, my money-centered, my prosperity-centered. It's Jesus-centered. And fulfilling his calling on my life centered. And my family and my work and my, and my life and my church and everything that's a part of my life is all working towards fulfilling the calling of Jesus upon my life as a disciple, as a follower. And knowledge of the greatness of his power. Because what happens? What happens in life is... We lose hope in the calling. We feel like we're no good and useless. We lose hope in the inheritance of what we're going to receive in the future. We have nothing to look forward to. And what happens? We get weak, all right? Maybe I just get weak, but we get weak when we're, when we're tarrying and we're, and we're working and we're, we're working for the Lord and serving his kingdom and reaching people and people don't appreciate it and people think we're crazy. That's all right. We get weak, though, but... We need to come into the knowledge of the greatness of God's power that my Father in heaven is powerful. He's mighty. He's rich and he's called me. He's given me a hope of a future inheritance. There's a home he's making for me. So when I live here on this earth in a tent, you know, sometimes with food, sometimes without, sometimes with clothes, sometimes without, whatever I may be facing in my life, I'm serving his kingdom. And one day he's going to bring me into the fullness of what I'm hoping for and rest. But right now it's time to get busy for the kingdom of God. His power, let's talk about his power, and we're going to wrap with these last few verses here. The power that worked towards us, I love that, that the greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. What is God's power like? And that's what we're going to see in these last few verses. And before we jump in, just maybe pause again and meditate on that. I see why I need hope. I see why I need to know the riches of his inheritance. I see why I need to know the greatness of his power. Just take a minute and pray, God, please. By the words of this prayer, I'm convicted and realize what I need to know. And I take a minute and pray, God, give me that spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of yourself. I want to be enlightened to know that there's hope to know that you have given me an inheritance, that you are powerful, that there isn't weakness. I don't serve a dead God, a false God, a weak God. A powerful God is who we serve and who we love and who has called us. His power, what is it? Verse 20, which he worked 
in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Man, power. What is it? Resurrection power. Jesus risen from the dead. And where is he? Seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. And he's above. So we're talking authority now. He's above all principalities, powers, might, dominion, every name that is named. Jesus is higher. Jesus is above it. Jesus is the name above every name. And he says, not only in this age, this isn't just a first century, first generation church thing. Every age to come, Jesus has the name that is above every other name. And he put all things under his feet. It's under his feet. It's under his feet. All things, everything is under his feet. He's in charge of it all. He's over it all. He's the Lord of it all. And I see, as we study this chapter, we're developing an understanding, first, of the Lord as our Redeemer. And here we see Jesus, the Lord, the Lord, the one in charge. We have Jesus, the Redeemer, and Jesus, the Lord. So, again, to rephrase that question as we, we, we come to, to wind this all up and make sense of all this. Do I know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? It's a great way to just start talking to somebody. You, people might think you're crazy, but try it. Why not? Going out one day, man, I feel like I need to evangelize. I feel like I need to preach the gospel. I feel like I need to talk to somebody about Jesus. It's, I can't count the different types of conversations and amazing experiences I've had with people just by starting a conversation with that word. Take a group of five, six, seven, eight people and decide, you know what, today, let's, let's go out and, and just, let's go out and preach the gospel. Let's go out and talk to people. And we set two, three hours out of our day and we walked around and we just walked around and walked up to people. Hey, I got a question for you. Do you know Jesus? You'll catch some people off guard. And you'll start to hear all kinds of different answers. And trust the Lord, know his word, he's going to equip you. Some people will say, you're crazy, shut up, I don't care about that. That'll happen, that's all right. W once they start throwing rocks at you, then we're really getting biblical. But uh, people will reject it, people will think you're nuts, people don't want to hear it. But people need to know Jesus, right? How will they know? unless we preach? How will they believe unless they hear God's word? How are we going to preach unless we're sent? I like those questions, thinking about those things. Do you know Jesus? And for those of you listening tonight, that's the question. Do you know Jesus as Savior, as your Redeemer, as God, the one who's called you, the one who redeems you by the blood of Jesus, and the one who's given you an inheritance. Do you know him as your redeemer and as your Lord? There was a man who at a time in his life where he was experiencing great loss, Great trial, great tribulation, great confusion, mixed ideas. He had an encounter with God after facing very hard times. Towards the end of his life, he had this encounter with God, and here's what he had to say about it. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, 
but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. May God give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of himself. And that by coming to know him, you will find hope. And maybe you will first have to experience brokenness because your faith has been built simply upon information. But may today be a day where that changes, where we no longer seek to just memorize and have scholarly, academic information about God. No longer being satisfied with just hearing about him. I've heard of God. I, I know the information about him. But to truly see, to perceive, to be familiar with, to be thoroughly acquainted with the living God who we call Father, who we call Savior, who we call Lord. But my prayer for all of us tonight is that we would truly, truly know Him. Let's pray. Father, help us, please. God, as we look to your word, as we, we study these scriptures, I pray, Lord, for help in understanding and knowing you. God, I don't want my walk of faith to simply be uh, just words and, and ideas. God, I, I want it to be alive. I want it to be active. I want it to be true. I really want it to be uh, uh, this relationship. I, I know that's what it is because that's what the, the word says. That's what the scripture says. But I don't want my faith to simply be, well, it says it in the Bible, so it must be true. God, I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you, God. I want to have hope. I want to know about this inheritance. I want to know the greatness of your power. God, work it in my life. God, remind me of that story, my testimony, why I can say God is good because. I have hope because. Look at what God has done. Lord, I pray for anyone right now who may be coming to a point where, and I don't, I don't have a great answer for why God is good, why I know that God is good, or why I know, why I'm, if I'm thoroughly acquainted with him or not. God, I pray for healing, comfort, and to, to just be able to rejoice in the fact that you've invited us into so much more than just words. You've invited us into so much more than just here's what to do, now do it, and I'm absent. You've invited us to something so much more than just obligations and duties and responsibilities and, and you're nowhere to be found, God. You've invited us into so much more to know you. God, I want to know you more. Lord, we draw near to you tonight. And we give you thanks for being a loving father. God, you're so good. I know that's a fact of eternity. 
But I also know that that's a truth in my life. Bring my brothers and sisters into a greater understanding of yourself tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name.